Physiology and Anatomy. And he is the current director for the Division of Lung Diseases at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute from the NIH. Uh, Dr. Kiley is uh, here. He thought he'd be on vacation. <laughs> but we're putting in a full working day to approach this very, very important topic that is probably um, the only major uh, chronic disease that is on the rise. It's, uh, he'll tell you more about this phenomenon uh, of COPD and what we must do to uh, stem the tide. Uh, Dr. Kylie has disclosed that he has nothing to disclose, and uh, we're very pleased to have him today. Thank you very much, Dr. Tam. It's really an honor and a, and a pleasure uh, to be here in your beautiful state. And um, yes, I think I'll still have some time for vacation, even though a uh, little detour and do a little work along the way, because I am absolutely passionate and committed to what I'm going to talk with you about today. So I think it's very, very important that um, uh, all of us sort of uh, reset our ideas, our concepts, our attitudes, and our approaches to a problem that is ravaging this country. It is a devastating problem. It is uh, rising in epidemic proportions. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what this is, uh, what, what, what's going on around this problem and, and why we have uh, reason to be great, uh, greatly concerned. So um, again, uh, thank you for the invitation. And I'm going to try and uh, hopefully in the next 45 minutes or so um, do uh, what might be more of a whirlwind run through the current concepts and future directions uh, around the area of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. And, um, and I think that uh, you have a handout. It has lots of slides in there. Um, I trimmed a few of those out, so not everything that's in there will be covered here, but, but I think the, uh, a, a good number of them will be. Um, unfortunately, I won't probably drill down to the depths of any particular concept, mechanism, model, or uh, therapeutic intervention that you might want to hear about, but certainly um, I think this, this is an attempt to kind of give you a broad overview of where we are in terms of research uh, around this problem. So what I would like to do then is to describe to you um, a little bit about the burden of this problem, some of the pathophysiology that we uh, currently um, know, uh, what some of the current management strategies are what the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute is doing uh, around this particular area, both in terms of research and education, and then give you just a quick look at where we at the NIH see the future of this uh, disease going in terms of research, education, and training. So let me just start, make sure that we're all sort of on the same page, so to speak, with uh, how we're defining COPD. And I would like to do that by just taking a page out of the most recent uh, GOLD guidelines that we release. As many of you know, GOLD is a global initiative for chronic obstructive lung disease, and they, that body, that group, just released some new guidelines around how to uh, diagnose, manage, and treat COPD. And if you look at how they've defined this disease, they call it a preventable and treatable disease with some significant extrapulmonary effects that may contribute to the severity in individual patients. Its pulmonary components are characterized by airflow limitation that is not fully reversible. And I'm going to come back to this whole concept of airflow limitation. And I think what all of you probably recognize right away is this whole concept about reversibility. And that's something that's somewhat new from what you may have learned 20 years ago uh, or, or longer or, uh, around uh, the, um, the understanding of this disease. And that the airflow limitation here is usually progressive and is associated with an abnorm abnormal inflammatory response of the lung to noxious particles or gases. So this is basically the definition that I think most people uh, in the field, certainly most of the professional societies, uh, with some minor variation, will use to uh, define COPD. So let's first take a big picture look at what's happened in terms of the changes in COPD mortality with, in relationship to other major causes of death uh, over about the past three decades or so. And what you can see most strikingly and almost instantly is that there is one disease that is clearly on the rise and another one that's quite a bit further behind it 
but is also on the increase. So on the far left, you can see, um, let's see, here we go, um, COPD, and this is uh, the uh, percent change in death rate for this disease over the past 30 years or so, and you can see it's a h over 100% increase. At the same time, we've made great strides at um, reductions in diseases uh, related to the heart, to cancer, and to stroke, the other leading causes of death. And what you can't see very well over here is uh, diabetes, which uh, is, has uh, also shown a slight increase um, over this period of time. So at present, COPD is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States, and it's projected to be third uh, by 2020 if the trends that we're seeing today, the smoking rates that continue today, and what we know is in the pipeline today as a result of 20 or 30 years of smoking uh, continue. So even if we were to go in right now and cut the pipeline off at, in, in, at some point, this disease is going to be around for uh, a good uh, 10 to 20 years more. So, and I think that we, haven't, we have not been able to, to, uh, to, to uh, cut that pipeline as sharply as we'd like, so I think we're going to see this around for um, an even longer period of time. But that means that we need to be much more aggressive and much more targeted in terms of how we attack this condition. Now, if I present these data just a little bit differently for you, um, we've plotted on this curve pretty much the same duration of time, about a 40-year period of time on the x-axis. But here now what I show you is deaths related the, uh, to um, total deaths uh, in the United States related to respiratory disease alone. So this cur these curves show you that for some of the leading causes of respiratory, the, some of the leading causes of death in this country are due to respiratory disease. Lung cancer, as you can see in green, is one of the ones that has been sharply increasing, but, uh, uh, but, but we can take pride in the fact that the rates of deaths, total deaths in this country due to lung cancer have plateaued over about the past five to 10 years or so. And other, other diseases of the lung have also shown some uh, variable but mostly increasing trends over this period of time. But the one, again, that I'm talking about with you today is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And if you just take a look at that alone, of all the respiratory diseases, there's been a five-fold increase in the total number of deaths due to lung disease alone of all deaths um, in the United States over this period of 40 or so years. So clearly a growing, growing problem. Now, what's also particularly worrisome about, the, um, about this disease is that although we don't have the greatest prevalence data in the United States, we do have some pretty good um, information that has come out of Dave Menino's work and that's been published out of the Centers for Disease Control in their MMWR reports. And this shows you um, over, uh, again, about a 30-year period of time what the pre what the prevalence looks like for COPD. And so for, from about 1987, um, we've seen a relatively stable prevalence in terms of uh, males, but what we're seeing is a increase in the prevalence of COPD among women. And in fact, it's significantly different than males. And what we now know is that in 2002, and that data is not plotted here, but if we go back and look at deaths, for the first time in history, the numbers of women dying from COPD exceeded the numbers of men dying from COPD in the year 2002. So a particularly troublesome statistic. Now why is that so? For, if I could just divert a bit from what we, um, from, from the overview and the epidemiology and the burden. And I think one of the reasons uh, that women may have COPD in greater uh, proportions than that of men is just based on the size of the airway and the histological changes in the airway that we see in women that we don't see in men. And here you can see that as the percent predicted of FEV1 declines, you see the log ratio of the wall area to the perimeter increase. So it's just telling us what we know, that the women's airways are a bit smaller and narrower. In fact, the impact of tobacco smoke or other irritants on the airway in a smaller uh, cross-sectional area may impact greater than if you have a larger airway size. In fact, that's what this plot here on the right then shows you. If you just take that data and put it in a histogram, you can see that 
the, uh, the, the, the uh, females have a greater uh, total wall area to the uh, ratio than uh, that of the, the men, and um, if, therefore may be more impacted by uh, the fact that geometrically they have different size airway. Now, jumping back then to the overall um, um, burden of this disease, we certainly know that clinical COPD is probably just the tip of the iceberg. And this metaphorical cartoon looking kind of image really kind of just tells us that we know right now that there are probably somewhere around 2 million people that have severe disease. And probably underneath the tip of the iceberg, there's maybe, but above the surface, about 10 million that have been diagnosed. But then there's subclinical COPD, and there's probably as many as another 12 million people in this country that are either undiagnosed or really don't even know that they have um, the uh, disease at all and may not have symptoms warrant, that warrant uh, attention by the healthcare uh, system or healthcare providers. So then if we can summarize quickly what we know about the statistics around COPD, we think that perhaps as many as 24 million may be affected. We know that there's about 120,000 deaths a year leading to the, giving this the, the, the horrible distinction of being the fourth ca leading cause of death in this country. What's also really troubling about this disease is that we, we estimate that about 900,000 uh, individuals are disabled who are working aged adults with this disease. So you think about COPD as an elderly disease, one where maybe this is something that happens late, fairly late in years. And true, there's, there's, there's a fair amount of COPD in, an old, in the older population. But we're starting to really recognize now that in the 45 to 55, 60 year old range, there's a lot more COPD than we once thought. Now if you think about that, that's almost in some of the prime working uh, age categories of most uh, most um, uh, 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 people working um, Americans, and so we we may be really shortening the productive life of of an individual as a result of this disease, and again adding to the overall burden of this disease economically. And if we put it all together, both in terms of direct costs, hospitalization, emergency room visits, uh, lost days of productivity. And, and overall impact on, on society, and particularly the healthcare system, we estimate this disease is costing this country $37 billion a year. Now, back up again quickly to the fact that um, this also impacts on overall quality of life. And that's what's shown on this uh, summary um, um, uh, slide from uh, Marian Lopez uh, almost a decade ago now, where they plotted the 1990 rank of a number of different diseases uh, and then showed how that has, to, has uh, changed over um, about a two decade uh, period of time. And what you can see at the very bottom in blue, highlighted in blue, is that COPD ranked 12th in overall burden in terms of disability adjusted life years. In 1990, it's up to fifth. Um, uh, it will rank fifth by 2020, uh, again, with the continued trends that we see today. So again, this is a big problem, and it's growing, and it seems to be impacting on a large proportion of the population. In fact, what really we're starting to get a handle on now is what is this doing to everyday uh, activities for patients and individuals that have this disease? And what this data uh, plots is, is from Steve Renard's work a couple few years ago where he looked at um, the um, limitation in activities for all uh, patients with COPD, both those above 65 and those under 65. And again, you can see pretty much along the whole path here that, um, that it impacts on multiple domains. And what you can mostly see is normal physical exertion seems to be what uh, definitely uh, is, is, um, is, is limiting in terms of uh, patients with COPD. Now, overall, we realize, we, we, we've known a lot about the natural history of COPD for many years. And this is a modified version of a very familiar graph that most of you probably know from Fletcher and Pito uh, dating way back uh, in the 60s, 
where they really theoretically and hypothesized that this was sort of what would happen to an individual uh, in, the, in, the, in the evolution, if you will, of COPD. And if you see the normal individual in white, this is just an age-related change in, in lung function as you go from early, from, you know, early, late adolescence, early adulthood into uh, uh, an, an older uh, 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 category. And then if you smoke, um, you can see in yellow, uh, and develop COPD, you have this rather precipitous, rapid decline in lung function, leading to uh, dyspnea uh, and, and limitations in activity and, and, um, and, and, uh, and then ultimately death. And then variants around that in orange, which shows what happens if you quit, what happens uh, at, at various stages along the way. And in fact, we have some pretty good data around uh, substantiating that uh, particular uh, curve. So this is not just hypothetical, this is really a, uh, a very good uh, representation of what uh, occurs in this disease. Now you can't uh, talk about COPD without talking about the risk factors and there are certain risk factors that we absolutely know about and we have pretty good evidence of, uh, that, that they, they are critical. And then there are other um, host factors that we uh, have some reason to believe are probable and, prob and, and likely involved in this disease. Certainly we know that genes are involved. We, this is, this is an, almost a no-brainer because we know that um, one in five individuals who smoke don't get COPD, even though 90% of the smoking-related deaths are uh, uh, deaths related to, to tobacco smoke uh, ca can be attributed to COPD, other related lung diseases, but certainly not everyone develops this disease. So that sort of right off tells you that there has to be an interaction between the environment, the exposure, and the genetic susceptibility or makeup of that individual that leads one to either go on and become that rapid decliner or alternatively may be protected. In fact, why do some people smoke for 40 years and by the time you measure their lung function when they're 85, it shows no difference from what a normal uh, ex-smoker, a, a normal non-smoker would, would, uh, would have for, for that degree of lung function at that age. Uh, we know also, and we learned um, in the 60s and 70s about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, so we know that there's genes involved there because, as you all know, this is the genetic form of COPD because even if you don't smoke and have alpha-1, you have this rapid decline in lung function. There are other probable causes. We think that there are other genes involved. I'll get to that a little bit later. We also know that, that maybe poor lung growth is critical in this whole development of this disease. In fact, new concepts are emerging right now that COPD may actually have its inception uh, in utero and in early childhood. And this is a concept that probably many people never even envisioned or thought about when they were thinking about COPD in their clinical practice and seeing patients coming in after many years of smoking when they're 50, 55, 60 years old, that it actually had its roots back uh, in utero. Now, there's no doubt that exposure is critical in this disease. Tobacco smoke is it. Um, we know that there's still great over 45 million people in this country that smoke, and that um, uh, is, um, is still way, way too many. And in fact, it goes back to the point I made earlier that this is a population of individuals that you're going to see in your practices in the years to come. And we really need to take aggressive steps, not only to continue with the anti-smoking campaigns that have gone on around this country and the world, I would say, but also really critically enforce it, critically deliver the message about not only the importance of smoking to overall health, but its impact on your lungs and COPD. There are also other reasons here, too. The occupational dust, the chemicals, infections, low socioeconomic status, all of these things are likely to play a a role in this disease as, as risk factors. But the key point here is at the bottom, and that is that it's the host factor in environmental interactions that determines who will end up getting COPD. So I don't want to go too far into this, but I think, uh, there, as I said, it's the most important risk factor for COPD, and I think in all of your practices, I hope and that you are aggressive in terms of uh, getting and aiding your patients in quitting smoking. And there's a whole number of steps that you can take. This is just uh, quickly summarizes what came out of a uh, World Health Organization workshop that we did with, um, with them uh, many years ago around uh, uh, aiding individuals to quit smoking. Now why is that so important? Well, for many reasons, but I think we've actually put 
some of the final nails in the coffin here of wh why this, wh the links between smoking and, and survival and particularly as a result of, of, of lung disease. This is data that was published um, in the Annals of Internal Medicine just a couple of years ago, came from the Lung Health Study, which the Institute started back in the early 80s. And they have subsequently followed this cohort of very, very mild airflow limited individuals who were classified as having COPD, but many never even had symptoms of COPD. They did have reduced lung function. But if you continue to track those individuals over about a 15 year period of time and look at all cause uh, mortality uh, by separating these individuals from those who quit smoking or, and uh, were in the sort of intervention group of the study versus those who were in usual care who were given smoking cessation advice but may not have quit smoking, you can see that over time there's no question that there's increased mortality in the individuals who are in the usual care group continue to smoke versus those who quit smoking were in the special intervention group. And in fact, those lines out there at 15 years are starting to diverge, which is telling you that it's even the, the effect is even stronger the further out you go in terms of overall survival. Now, that's also been replicated, again, more data from the lung health study. This is the 11-year data, just looking at cross-sectionally um, and uh, the, the, the three categories that we looked at, the smoker, the quitters, the intermittent quitters, and the continuous smokers. And you can see their, the effects on lung function here. Now, I'm not talking about survival anymore. I'm talking about just their lung function here. And this, um, again, is a compilation of a couple of studies that have co corroborated this data, or this, these results from the lung health study. But again, you can see out here um, that as, uh, as you progress down the years, you can uh, clearly see that the sustained quitters have a tremendous benefit over the continuous smokers in terms of their overall uh, preservation of lung function. Now I want to sort of uh, see if I can capture as we kind of move through the clinical presentation and the, the epidemiology and the burden, wh what I think is also another emerging concept that you want to, to take into account in your practice. And that is the systemic effects of COPD. We're starting to really begin to learn a lot about what impact this disease has on other organ systems and the, the individual. Um, and sort of step back and sort of take a holistic approach to this, um, to this condition. So I think what I've kind of painted for you is a big picture of a population that may have some airflow limitation. And this is, a, this is not an original concept because this came from uh, uh, Auguste in, in, uh, in a recent uh, publication in the Proceedings of uh, the American Thoracic uh, Society. And he shows that within that airflow limitation population, it may be very, very large numbers, we have categories of, in, of individuals who have uh, early COPD, bronchitis, chronic bronchitis, bronchiolitis. There may be uh, a category, there is a category of emphysematous patients, and then there's a group that have some overlap, uh, and, and the common element underlying that is airway inflammation. So here you may have some asthmatics that kind of fold in that may look like um, uh, having some irreversible parts of their, um, of their uh, obstruction. And what's important in terms of looking at this whole picture is that this category of individuals are going to present with symptoms, some early, some not. They're going to have some limitations in their activities, as I, as I mentioned. They're going to have some health-related quality of life decrements, and there's going to be some exacerbations in those who have emphysema or more chronic um, severe bronchitis, and then they have varying prog prognoses. And what we're now adding to this whole collection of, of, of symptoms and, and, um, and, and, um, and this, 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 these phenotypes is that there's a group here that seem to have this body of airflow imita imita limitation, inflammation, but also have this systemic inflammation. So one could might argue that what's going on in the lung is an early sign of what may actually start happening in the vasculature, and then what might actually start being seen in the, in the, in the, in the heart, in, in other systems. And what we really are starting to now try to do is pull together some of these data to sort of look at those systemic effects, because we know, we've known for a long time, that cachexia seems to go along very closely with COPD, and in fact, 
having a low BMI is really a bad prognosticator for future uh, survival in COPD. So there's a whole body of information about what this these systemic, the systemic inflammation may be doing to skeletal muscle dysfunction and to other aspects of bone, uh, and, and, and then you can look at the whole system, whether it be um, related to cancer or depression and fatigue. So it's kind of a, a you know, it's, it's, a, it's a much bigger problem than just in the lung. That's my point. And why do we think that that's the case? Well, here's the data that sort of underlie that concept. And I think what you can see from here, and I'll tell you a little bit about the TORCH results, which, which again support these findings here. But those people dying, um, if you just c capture mortality uh, in, in COPD, those with mild COPD and those with more severe COPD, you see that overall the more severe COPD you have, the, more, the higher the likelihood is that, that you'll die from a respiratory disease, the respiratory cause. But in fact, if you look at the gray and the, and the red parts of these graphs, and particularly those who have mild disease, the individuals with, that, that are classified as COPD die from other causes. So it's telling you right away that it's not just the lung. There are other things going on, uh, either in the cardiovascular system or in other organ systems that are leading to their death. And in fact, that's partly where uh, I think we start to see the impact of having such great success in reducing mortality from cardiovascular disease. And now these individuals are living longer, and we're seeing their deaths due to respiratory disease as they get out there further, as the, this graph on the right shows. Now, what are the consequences of all this airflow limitation? And I think that if you just take a look at all of that, you, you know all of these symptoms and you've seen a lot of this in your patients. Uh, there's hyperinflation, there's gas trapping, there start to become symptoms around dyspnea, wheeze, excess cough, purulent cough, um, and it, there's some deconditioning going on, there's a direct, uh, direct diminution in overall exercise capacity and tolerance, there's a more of a tendency to be inactive, sedentary, and as you know, that is also a bad prognostic indicator. I think that even in patients with COPD, you got to keep moving, you got to keep walking, you can't be sedentary. And then there's a serious deterioration in overall health. And as you develop more of these symptoms, as you get more severe, there are exacerbations which tend to really accelerate the overall decline in lung function. So this is just the big picture look at what is this airflow limitation leading to. So if I can switch now and get out of the burden and get out of the overall impact of this disease and touch on some of the pathophysiology, then um, I think we can move down and, and touch some of these major concepts. Very busy slide, but what I really want to point out with this one is that there's some fundamental elements of the pathophysiology of this disease that we've learned through animal models, through some molecular cellular biology that has occurred over about the past 30, 40 years, and from the translation of that information into humans, that we clearly know that oxidative stress and the role of reactive oxidative species are really critical in the central underpinnings of this disease. And what this slide just kind of tries to depict is all the different impacts that these uh, oxidative species have on the uh, various uh, elements that go into what ultimately becomes bronchoconstriction, hyper, um, hyper responsiveness, and then some of the, um, the, 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 the elements around uh, what those uh, uh, species, oxidative species, are doing to, uh, to, the, to the lung and to manifestation of disease. So there is a lot of destruction of pulmonary tissue as a result of oxidative stress to the lung, and clearly cigarette smokes uh, um, recruiting the various cells into the lung, releasing these uh, reactive ox oxidative species is really caught in playing a key role. We've known for many, many years that the whole concept of elastases and the balance between proteases and antiproteases is absolutely critical in COPD. And we're beginning to learn a lot, uh, we have learned a lot, in fact, we're starting to learn a lot more about various categories of uh, neutrophil elastases. And, and, and you probably, if you followed the literature, the metalloproteinases are really just burgeoning. There's more and more data coming out of animal model work, even applications in vitro that are starting to tell us many, many things about the role of MMPs in the pathobiology of this disease. And clearly, although this is not what we have once thought to be the underlying 
um, uh, cause of this disease. We know that this, uh, this, this imbalance in, uh, in, in the destruction of the extracellular matrix by the proteases in COPD is very, still very central to the disease. But by and large, one cannot walk, uh, talk about this disease without talking about inflammation because this disease is clearly characterized by inflammation. And we know that the cigarette smoke will recruit lots of different cells into the lung and will activate cells that reside in the lung. So certainly the macrophages, it has a very direct impact on the airway epithelial cells. And, and that then causes a cascade of events that goes on in the release of a number of different cytokines and chemokines, most notably the CD8 uh, T lymphocytes are clearly activated by cigarette smoke and are going to then have a quite a um, um, major impact on either the progression of this disease or further lung damage and, and, uh, and uh, again, some of the symptoms that you see, whether it's the, on the goblet uh, uh, mucus uh, glands and the hypersecretion or in uh, developing up more of a fibrotic uh, type lesion. So here again, uh, I think the central role of inflammation in the uh, lung as a result of some uh, smoke induced lung injury is clearly um, uh, an area that has a pretty strong body of evidence and I think we're learning a lot and that information is now being translated into what might help us with targeted therapies. Now this just sort of helps you image or visualize uh, what that inflammation is doing to the overall alveolar architecture. And this is some work done, very elegant work by Jim Hogg, who was, pub was published in, uh, in 2004 in The Lancet, and I think, um, again, followed up uh, later by Peter Barnes. But I think it's absolutely evident uh, what you're seeing here when you look histologically at this, at the uh, airways and cl clearly the small airways and the alveolar architecture uh, in, the, um, in the human lung. And here on the left, you can see uh, what the new, no, nice, healthy, normal lung looks like. And I don't think there's any surprise what you see on the right. And that's the, the airway uh, of a COPD patient. Clearly uh, bronchoconstricted, uh, lumen is very narrow, very high basement th uh, intimal thickening, uh, breakdown of the alveolar septa. I mean, just the inflammation has some very, very destructive uh, properties on the airway and particularly the small airways. Now, you might think, oh, this is just what you see in end stage. This is what you see in severe emphysema, but absolutely not. This is data, again, from Jim Hogg's work where he looked at all of that very, very beautiful pathology and aligned it to various gold stages. Now, the gold stages, are the, uh, for those of you who don't know, come from the guidelines where they rank the severity of COPD going from no COPD in the old guidelines, they had a gold stage zero, which was actually close to normal, going up to more severe disease, which is gold stage four. Not to dwell on that too much, but what you can see is in any gold stage, uh, certainly it gets worse as you get more severe disease, more airway uh, inflammation, more, uh, uh, more towards the emphysematous phenotype. But no matter where you are, even very, very mild, these are all smokers or ex-smokers, you see uh, signs of inflammation. Recruitments of neutrophils, macrophages, eosinophils, the CD4 and CD8 T lymphocytes are all increased in across the whole spectrum. So it's happening very, very early on. It's a very key question in this disease right now is why does the inflammation persist even after you quit? And even after you've quit for many, many years, this is what you still see. So something is going on in the cells that are really being reprogrammed to continue to promote the, the, the release of these um, uh, damaging uh, inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. So what does the pathogenesis of COPD look like today? I had a slide that I took out that actually shows you what we thought in 1967 the pathogenesis of COPD was. And it was really cigarette exposure, release of neutrophils, breakdown of the extracellular matrix, emphysema, and death. Just like that. That's all you had to know. And if you picked up somebody that was sort of towards the right-hand side of that, you would say, gee, sorry, um, Mr. Smith, there's really not much we can do about you. And you're going to you know, end up you know, dying from this disease in some time not too distant future. But if you pick them up early, which was a an, an real anomaly, you might be able to do something. But back 20, uh, 20, 25 years ago, we didn't even have good knowledge on what to do with respect to bronchodilating the airway. So I think that the mindset has changed so greatly 
over this span of time that everybody needs to really re-educate themselves on this disease. And what I'm presenting to you here is my view of what the pathogenesis looks like today. Because we know that there are elements related to the immune system, there are elements related to the oxidative stresses that I talked to, about, talked to you about already, the matrix, where there's a whole host of things going on, particularly around the MMPs, and now a new concept that's also starting to emerge, and that is, uh, what's the role of apoptosis and proliferation in terms of overall uh, the pathogenesis? And so how does the program cell death process work in COPD? But what, if you take this body of information around the pathobiology of this disease and just hold on to that in and of itself, it isn't going to help us much. But what we've really been able to do over about the past half dozen years, 10 years, is to link those elements of mechanistic underpinnings of the disease to biological effects, whether it be the mucous metaplasia, the small airway disease, the emphysema, or the skeletal muscle dysfunction that I mentioned to you around the systemic effects. And if we tie that then to therapeutic targets where we could actually intervene way upstream from where uh, we usually intervene, then we can actually start to make progress at personalizing therapy based on what these in the individual presents for symptoms. And in fact, although I'm not going to talk about it, you see these therapeutic targets come upstream of cigarettes. Because I really believe that the tools and the methodologies and the, 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 in, the information that we have today to help people quit smoking are incredibly powerful. And you must use those. They must be part of your, your regimen. Now, why do I say that that's important? Because I believe that the targets for therapy are going to come from these boxes, these circles that I've just pr portrayed for you around these major categories of pathobiology. So whether we're talking about inflammation in the yellow, we already know that there are a number of anti-inflammatory drugs that have a role. They may not be the inhaled corticosteroids, but there are other things that are coming along, whether they be TNF-alpha blockers, whether they be 5-lipoxygenase inhibitors targeting that pathway, whether they be the Spireva, which is very, very popular and, and, and shows very great promise, or whether we're going to target things um, in the antioxidant category, where we might be able to benefit from things like NS and uh, acetylcysteine. Uh, so um, there are a lot of potential ways in which we can target this disease. In fact, I think it's going to come from a combination of these and not a single one. In fact, a new one that's being investigated right now is hyaluronic acid, which is a matrix stabilizer that may actually go back 30, 40 years to looking at a marker in urine, desmosine, and seeing whether or not that could help us predict who is going to have this greater breakdown in in, as a result of the protease uh, imbalance and maybe target therapy around that. Now, why is all that important? Why do we have to push in that direction? Because we know right now that current drug therapies yield improvements in subjective measures, quality of life, symptoms, those things, but little or no improvements in objective measures, such as mortality. So if we really want to impact on this disease in terms of the survival outcomes, we need to do a whole lot better than what I'm presenting to you here. So what I want to do is just quickly capture why I think there's a lot of excitement right now to get in that, go in that direction. Because again, if you look in terms of what kind of animal models and what kind of research is being done in those models to investigate uh, avenues and mechanisms that might lead us towards uh, a better understanding of this disease uh, at the fundamental molecular level, there's some good, inf good data being generated right now uh, looking at, for instance, IL-13 and its role in terms of the um, uh, lung architecture. Looking at IL-13 and the MMP-12 uh, molecule in terms of its role in matrix degradation and matrix stimula uh, um, um, uh, um, it, it, it architecture. And then in the area of apoptosis and proliferation, we're starting to get some good insights into the role of uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, and inhibiting that in terms of maybe, uh, again, pr preserving or, or, or not uh, accelerating the damage in the lung. And then in the area of oxidative stress, we kind of see now through some of this animal model work uh, the role of superoxide dismutase in this whole concept. So the animal models are really bringing us new insights into pathogenesis that might target therapy. Another exciting area of research 
that is just getting started is looking at the role of genetics in a little different way than the way we've looked at it before. And here is just a quick snap, which you may not actually be able to see, from some work coming out of the Boston group that really does uh, look at the role of um, genome-wide association type work to really look across the genome for those genes that may be expressed uh, in those individuals with COPD. And if we just, again, use this analogy around genes that may be involved in the immune system, in the oxidative stress pathways, in matrix preservation, or in apoptosis, we see a number of candidate genes that are being associated with these different COPD phenotypes. And then if we take it one step further and start using uh, RNA and looking at um, the, the message uh, side of it and use genomics technology, again, I can uh, show you uh, data that's starting to surface that's looking at various gene expression profiles that are correlating with vis different phenotypes like FEV1 or diffusion capacity. And these are just some, again, some, some, uh, some genes that seem to be very active and lighting up in this array over here on the left that uh, when you, when you uh, look at this, the COPD uh, phenotypes. Now, if we move then from pathophysiology into the clinical domain, we know that this is a very complex disease. The susceptibility is poor. There's diverse manifestations. It's a very heterogeneous population, and there are frequent comorbidities. First thing I think we're trying to make sure we're all doing is that is diagnosing this disease. We know that there's a lot of mild disease. We know that there's a lot of asymptomatic. We know there's subclinical disease. We know that there are a lot of people out there who have airflow limitation who may be ex-smokers, former smokers, continuous smokers who are actually um, uh, in, at risk for developing this disease. And I think that primary care physicians, subspecialists, pulmonologists really need to be sharp in identifying those individuals. And particularly if you have a history of smoking, you know, have a lot of cough, sputum production, any signs that you have respiratory distress, dyspnea, uh, or symptoms, or frequent respiratory infections, these are all indications where you may want to probe a lot more in terms of their history and their current situation. What are the goals for management? These come right straight out of gold, but they're also very much similar to what you see in the ATS ERS guidelines. I think you're very familiar with these. Relieve symptoms, prevent disease progression as best we can, improve exercise tolerance, health status, uh, try to minimize complications, reduce mortality. We know that we can't uh, intervene and um, because there are no interventions right now that will change the natural history or prevent death resulting from COPD. There are only two things that we know will do that, smoking cessation and oxygen. Everything else right now um, is palliative mo for the most part, but can do a lot in terms of improving quality of life. I'm going to quickly skim over um, non-pharmacological approaches. Um, and, and again, I can't emphasize enough smoking cessation, but things, simple things like vaccinations are key. Pneumococcal vaccinations and influenza are really important in this population. Optimizing nutrition, pulmonary rehab, and there may be a role uh, for, lung tra uh, for lung volume reduction surgery and in certain uh, t uh, individuals' lung transplantation. Now, pulmonary rehab is the, ro the Rodney danger field of this disease because it gets no respect whatsoever. Um, the fact is that there's lots of good that pulmonary re rehab can, can do. And I just sort of quickly uh, indicated some of the common indications for using, prescribing, and getting your, indiv your patients into pulmonary rehab. And then also what constitutes a good rounded program, whether it be just, it can't be just one thing. It's got to be education, exercise training, behavioral and nutritional counseling. And we have pretty good information and data right now, and this slide summarizes that for you on the documented outcomes of pulmonary rehab and COPD. It does reduce dyspnea. It does improve health-related quality of life. It reduces exacerbations. Um, it, um, it does not improve pulmonary function testing. You know that. Or uh, it doesn't do much in the way of changing the blood gases. Um, and we don't know whether it reduces mortality. Right now, the, the, the verdict is out on that. But in fact, the, the, the other uh, benefits here clearly are important and are useful in um, in d prescribing pulmonary rehab and having patients with COPD engage in a very ag active pulmonary rehab program. Nutrition in COPD is also important because I mentioned earlier low BMI is common in, P in COPD and it is a poor pro prognosticator. Um, it, it, uh, there are a number of uh, important things that nutritional support will do and, um, and this all is beneficial in COPD. 
So if we look at then uh, the pharmacological treatment of COPD, this slide just kind of gives you the quick overview of what you see in the ATS ERS um, uh, guidelines for pharmacological treatment. And I'm not going to really go through it in any depth or detail, but I think, you know, clearly you're going to confirm the diagnosis and in certain individuals where there's intermittent symptoms, cough, wheeze, dyspnea, you may be using something like a short-acting bronchodilator on a PRN basis. As you get more persistent symptoms, you may be uh, using some of the long-acting bronchodilators. Um, and then we start to get into combination therapy, and we start to get into other substitutes and other more experimental approaches to therapy. And some of these still uh, are in a research um, environment. A common question that we get a lot is, well, what is the role of inhaled corticosteroids in terms of overall regular management of patients with COPD? And I think this data from Rand Sutherland that was published a few years ago really does summarize it quite nicely. And you can see um, the solid lines sort of going down the middle of the graphs on, graphs on either side with the yellow uh, triangle or, or image at the bottom is the line of identity there. And you can see it varies from study to study, but by and large, you really don't see much of an effect of uh, improvements in post-bronchodilar FEV1 compared to placebo uh, when you use inhaled corticosteroids for this disease. And in fact, uh, if you do the p-value, the statistics on this are non-significant. So you do not have good evidence, or any evidence for that matter, to use inhaled corticosteroids in the regular management of patients with COPD. Now what you do uh, maybe uh, know about is the results from the TORCH trial that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this brings us into the domain of combination therapy. And um, again, it was a study that was incredibly well designed, and, and it had a very, very good analytical framework, and it was an excellent, um, and, and the results were quite enlightening. Unfortunately, as you know, this study did not reach statistical significance in terms of absolute improvements in the use of either combination therapy, salmeterol uh, uh, and fluticasone, in combination or individually against placebo in all-cause mortality. But in, in fact, there were a lot of secondary outcomes that were very positive from this study. And I think that's partly one of the take-home messages from this. Clearly, a 25% reduction in moderate to severe exacerbations keep people out of the hospitals. That's a good thing. Uh, and very big improvements in, in the St. George Respiratory Quotient, which is the way of measuring quality of life. And that was uh, uh, excellent. And also uh, improvements in overall FEV1 compared to placebo over the uh, three-year period. So there were good outcomes, positive outcomes from this study, and I don't think we should cast this study aside just because it didn't reach statistical significance in terms of mortality. And I'll just sort of quit on the, uh, on the therapy side with one um, slide from Hanina in chest several years ago that I think brings us closer to a better understanding of the role of, of combination therapy in this disease. And I actually think that in the next few years, and that's why I say keep tuned, that you're not going to just have two drugs in an inhaler like we have now with Advair. We're going to have three and four drugs available, so it's going to be triple therapy or quadruple therapy to really target these various categories that I've talked with you about. And these data really do show clearly the, the benefits of, in this case, uh, fluticasone and salmeterol um, uh, against either placebo or them in, 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 uh, separately uh, on overall changes in lung function, admittedly over a relatively small 24-week period. But nonetheless, uh, it's showing importance. Another class of drugs that I think you should also be familiar with and be aware are coming down the road if you're not already using them are the macrolides. And the macrolides are, um, here's just a whole just collection of things that macrolides do in terms of biological response modifiers. But that's not, uh, but, but I think that's, uh, that's the basis for why you might want to use those agents in this disease. But we have trials going on right now in our COPD research network that are really testing head-to-head -head in a randomized fashion the role of, of, um, of uh, the macrolides in uh, macrolide antibiotics in terms of its treatment for exacerbation, certainly, and overall um, in the management of patients with COPD. So another class of drugs that may very well come your way uh, very soon uh, based on what we find in these trials. Um, 
The other area that I want to touch on is lung volume reduction surgery. And this is a slide that comes from our National Emphysema Treatment Trial. It was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2003. And this, I only picked up one piece of this trial to, to tell you because it has so many elements to it and you could spend a long time on this trial. But what this one is, is it shows the beneficial sub effect on uh, a subgroup in terms of overall mortality um, based, uh, in t based on medical versus lung volume reduction surgery and, uh, and the type of individual who will gain that benefit. And what you see here is those individuals who have upper low predominant disease, very low exercise capacity, um, really do um, uh, better um, in terms of um, overall mortality. Um, with LVRS. So this is really a subgroup of individuals and so you really want to know uh, if your patient does fit this classification and think about this as a potential option. It may not work, it may, but it's still one that um, that is on the table. And in fact, when you look at the, all the data on this, um, and on the short haul, there were no differences between medical intervention and surgical intervention. Uh, but we're starting to see now out here at about uh, seven or eight years that the that the uh, the deaths from those in the surgical group seem to be a little better than the numbers of dying those dying in the medical group. So it may have some long-term effects if you survive some of the short-term um, um, complications. But in fact, in a subgroup, it does uh, have a role, and this does open up the door for future uh, uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. And I'll tell you just quickly that there's a lot of things going on right now with airway stents with various valves, with other innovative approaches that are really trying to get at the whole idea of how can we do non-invasive, well, it's invasive, but is slightly more, less non-invasive than, than, um, than open lung uh, surgery. Now, I can't leave a COPD treatment without touching on exacerbations because this is a big, big element around this disease. And I'm not going to spend really or do this very good justice here. But I think that what this slide just does is just to remind you that corticosteroid therapy, antibiotics, low flow oxygen, bronchodilators, all of these should be in your toolbox in terms of dealing with various types of exacerbations. And I'm going to leave it at that. I think there's good data around the use of inhaled and oral corticosteroids as well as um, combinations of different uh, bronchodilating agents to manage patients with, with uh, uh, patients with have, who have acute exacerbations. So this is the summary diagram of chronic management of COPD. Clearly, you're going to diagnose. You're going to need to use spirometry to do that. You'd hopefully be able to do that early. You want to reduce risk, educate uh, around smoking cessation, immunization, other exposures, uh, reduce symptoms. That's clearly what you can do if you identify early and you intervene early with various bronchodilators, inhaled corticosteroids, and pulmonary rehab. And you want to reduce complications. Keep people out of the hospital. Educate, and, um, and if need be, um, use oxygen judiciously and treat exacerbations too uh, aggressively. Now, there are a lot of new things coming on the horizon, and I don't have time to talk about all these things right now, but I'm going to touch on a few quick categories of drugs that give us even more promise and, and, and really um, suggest that you stay tuned. Long-acting anti-muscarinics are, are really being investigated quite extensively right now, and I think Amaryl is maybe already is, is close to being approved in this country for use. So that's a Glaxo drug, and that... Um, Will, um, will be around, I think, soon. Um, there are other things that Novartis, I think Indactorol is also one that's close to being ready to go um, from Novartis, 24-hour uh, long-acting beta agonist. Uh, there are actually some beta agonists that are coming online here soon that may even give uh, 30, 35 hours worth of relief. So those are really being ag uh, pro aggressively pursued. Things around the inhaled corticosteroids are also being looked at. I know that Glaxo has a lot of different things that are looking at ster steroid receptor agonists and so forth. There are also some things in development. So those are novel drugs that are sort of in the pipeline, maybe coming out sometime in, in the near future. These are things that are just starting to evolve right now. Things in the pharmacological uh, arena, such as the, um, the glitazones, um, hard to say whether or not these may have a role in, uh, in COPD. They're not getting a good rap right now in terms of cardiovascular disease, but nonetheless, they may have a role. The other one that I highlight here in the box is statins. And that, that's a very, very interesting story that's developing. And I think it's one that you should keep close watch on. I think there is a 
burning cry right now to do randomized controlled trials around this agent for C specifically for COPD. And I already mentioned the, the stents and, and, uh, and valves. Uh, why I'm a little bit enthused about the statins is because this paper was recently published in the Blue Journal, American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. Um, and this is a study that looked at C-reactive protein as a predictor of prognosis of COPD. And what they showed here in this paper, 14% of the hospitalizations were due to COPD in this study. This is the Copenhagen Heart Study, uh, City Study. Uh, one, uh, and 6% of those people died. The, ha the hazard ratios for hospitalizations and deaths uh, were 1.4 and 2.2 when individuals had CRP levels greater than 3 milligrams per liter. And then if you look at the 10-year risk for hospitalizations and deaths, it was about 55% for those over 70 years of age, those who had less than 50% of predicted FEV1. Again, over that 3 mill milligram cutoff. They conclude that CRP, P, CRP is an independent predictor of future COPD outcomes. So for the first time, here's a marker of, lo of, of inflammation in the vasculature that might be telling us something about what's going on in the lung and may have important implications in terms of treatment as well as survival. Now, quickly, let me hit on a couple of other very interesting concepts that are under, de in, under uh, development. Certainly, the role of retinoic acids in alveolar repair is critical and important. I'm not going to say too much about it, but there's some work going on related to uh, in animal models and certainly in bone man marrow transplant donors looking at whether or not you could actually use uh, retinoic acid and repair damaged lung. Unfortunately, our results from the steroid, uh, from the Forte study, this was the feasibility study of using retinoid acid, retinoid, retinoids in the treatment of emphysema, was a negative study. This was a feasibility study. It did not show significance with either atra or 13 cis retinoic acid. Um, but there's certainly a lot of questions around this that could be uh, answered with more basic research, you know, around the whole area of repair and, and, um, and scaffolding of the lung, and I think that would be really important. I'm going to then finish up here real quickly with um, some of the activities around uh, COPD and the NHLBI. And, um, let me just tell you that we've done a lot of workshops and planning to try to get ourselves organized and move in a strategic way towards addressing a clinical, basic, cellular, molecular, genetic basis of COPD. Over about the past decade, or uh, we've accelerated that activity with a whole host of programs ranging from the very, very basic science all the way up to the population. And there's really several categories that I think are important. One is to capitalize on genomics to really develop high through biomarkers that will get us further along in terms of identifying disease early. The second is to improve clinical methods uh, uh, approaches, so to look for intermediate outcomes, to look for, uh, use various approaches in networks, clinical networks, to optimize management and to be able to really uh, do proof of concept type studies. And then finally, we need to educate. And that's where I think an education and awareness program is critical for early identification, early diagnosis, and better management. Because if you identify early, you can intervene early, and you can improve overall quality of life. And that's really what the core is of our COPD education program. The Learn More, Breathe Better program is really an attempt to do just that, to increase awareness at at-risk patients. We've worked with our partners in, in um, the health uh, providers, the professional societies, the voluntary organizations. We've done a lot of work with uh, consumer outreach through using Wall Street Journal, Newsweek. We have a resource kit that you can obtain online that includes a whole bunch of things around educating and increasing awareness in this disease. So it's a complicated area. I'd like to present it as a disease that has a new look to it. And this is sort of a way to sort of get your hands around it and to sort of point to all the multifaceted features of this disease, but leave you with the idea that this is a disease where there's progress being made in all of these circles, and that um, I think that it's important that we continue that effort because it's through research in, uh, on genes, on molecules, on cells, on the human, on the whole organism, and then on the population that's going to get us to really have an impact on this uh, devastating disease. I wrote an editorial um, for the American uh, Journal of Family Practice not too long ago and it was entitled The Changing Face of COPD. And I think that when you take a look at COPD today, this is kind of the type of person that you might be encountering, and not the kind of person that you've maybe once thought of this disease of, and that is the person that slouched over the chair, very cachectic, weak, uh, frail, 
um, and uh, a real old elderly individual who really is sedentary and can't move. That's really still a phenotype that we do see today, clearly, but it's not the only phenotype that is, um, is common and probably uh, the, the one that we want to identify early as a, uh, and having an impact on this disease. So I want to thank you very much for your attention today and, uh, again, for the invitation to be here. Thank you so much, and it's great on that note on public education and awareness that we point out that there's going to be a lot of activities right here in this building, and there's going to be another talk mm -hmm. uh, at 1145. A little bit more oh. than the education. Okay, you're yeah, right. 1030 exhibits. So come on up. <laughs> Why don't you tell everybody what's up? Hi. Um, if people are interested, unfortunately, we are at capacity, and next year we'll try to make it bigger. But um, if people want to come, there will be uh, exhibits. We have about 24 exhibitors, um, and they'll be available from 1 o'clock on. Um, there will be a formal presentation by Dr. Kylie for anyone that's registered from 11.30 until 1, we're going to have Dr. Kylie and Dr. Pollard and a patient panel. Thank you. So if you'd care to uh, stay, um, we'll, we'll take questions Happy now from the audience. Sure. And I, there's no microphones out there, so um, we'll repeat the question if you have any. Sir. Marijuana smoking? Okay. Does that have anything to do with COPD? Well, I, th I think right now they, we don't probably have an adequate database to really draw uh, conclusions on uh, marijuana smoking directly. Clearly, it's a airway irritant. It's you're exposed to to smoke that has chemicals and other agents in it that will likely have a damaging effect on the lung. I don't think we have long-term studies. Do you? Are you aware I, I of any? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Like I mean, I, I would put it into the category of where it's a s exposure and it's probably a, a, a s exposure that has certainly an impact on airway um, uh, airflow uh, and, and airway architecture and perhaps even uh, initiating some uh, elements of inflammation and then how far that goes in terms of the manifestation of actual overt disease and COPD, I don't think we know. Good. Um, John, do you have a question? You have the microphones. I have one. Um, thanks to Dr. Sutherland about the uh, those meta-analyses mm -hmm. of uh, and the one about inhaled corticosteroids not having an effect, I understand when they um, redid it and they removed the people who continued to smoke or accounted for environmental tobacco smoke, that in that scenario, the, uh, the inhaled corticosteroids do have an effect, mm -hmm. showing that you do need to get people to stop smoking because the smoke itself inhibits the effects of uh, steroids uh, by, by virtue of the histone deacetylase, I think doesn't unwind the DNA so the steroids can't get in to do their effect. Mm -hmm. That's what I understand. Yeah, I, that's absolutely right. I, I showed you the population, the whole, all of the data from the whole, all of those studies combined. And again, it's like a lot of these, uh, it's, it's a very heterogeneous kind of a population. So when you separate out the different phenotypes, you may actually have some that respond well to inhaled corticosteroids. That doesn't tell you not to use them. I right. think that's, a, that's an effective intervention. But, you, you know, uh, you've got to really explore and you may have to do some trial and error a bit in the overall management. I think these are guidelines. These are just, um, you know, whole um, d data from large groups that are pooled and so you don't get quite the same So response. these subset analyses. I think um, some of the work in asthma is beginning to show this um, mm -hmm. because, you know, like the CAMP study, et cetera, mm -hmm. when they went and back and asked about the environmental tobacco smoke, that was limiting the effects of mm -hmm. steroids. And you can actually erase all the effects of uh, usual management if someone's still smoking in the home. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, uh, by all means. Didn't even touch on the ex environmental passive smoke. And in fact, the asthma network did a study recently looking at this very question is what's the impact of smoking? Uh, what's the impact in, in terms of inhaled corticosteroids in a smoking asthmatic population, one that we oftentimes exclude from asthma studies because you don't want to complicate things. And there was some data that suggested that anti-inflammatory inhaled um, uh, corticosteroids really do have a blunting effect and may be a lot less effective in those who are smoking. 
uh, uh, and have an asthmatic phenotype. And in fact, that's what turned out to be the case. But what interestingly came from that study was the, um, the, that uh, Monte Lucast um, uh, was, was seemed to have an effect, a positive an effect, on individuals who smoke and have asthma, whereas the inhaled corticosteroids didn't. Is this the so, Lazarus study? Yeah, this is okay. the Lazarus study. But Stop smoking first. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Don't take the pill. That's always the key <laughs> right. message, right? Take the, yes. Hi, I'm Karen Huang. I'm an asthma clinical pharmacist at Kaiser Permanente. Hi. I, first of all, I want to thank you so much for coming such a long way. And it was a great um, grand rounds t this morning. My question is, um, when does um, asthma cross over to COP COPD? Is it with the lung remodeling that you're looking for and the irreversibility, and that's when the diagnosis turns to COPD? Uh, it's, uh, that's a, a great question, and it's one that's just not really clearly known. And in fact, uh, I mean, the assumption that asthma turns into COPD is not really one that's well-grounded or founded at, at all. Uh, there are it's, a, it's an overlap, clearly, and there are some who believe uh, that th it is one phenotype. It starts in early childhood with some degrees of airway inflammation, remodeling, it goes on and then develops into something. And if you smoke, you're going to go on and develop COPD. That could very well be the case. Fortunately, I don't think we have as solid evidence that that's the way it absolutely goes. And then there's some that just don't. But the actual answer, I think, is surrounded around how much of this is irreversible, how much exposures do you have, uh, what is your response to, you know, a bronchodilator, um, and, you know, some of the other uh, aspects of what you see when you look at the airways, so either his histologically or pathologically. I don't know, maybe you want to add Well, you know, we have to, and, and actually for the medical students, we have to answer this question. But luckily for us, uh, NIH and the guidelines people really defined COPD as airflow limitation mm -hmm. that is not completely reversible. Mm -hmm. So when asthma proceeds to that point, then we'll call it COPD. And obviously, you can come by that airflow limitation by different kinds of inflammation and, and triggers. So I guess it's when it doesn't reverse. Um, and you know, I, uh, operationally, I define um, reversibility not just response to two puffs of albuterol in your office, mm -hmm. but before I say this is irreversible, we give it a real college try <laughs> with inhale, uh, steroids and everything and make sure it really isn't reversible, okay. completely reversible. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, I know there are so many questions. I'm going to talk to this guy for an hour. <laughs> and I just thank you so much for Welcome. coming My and for pleasure. all that information. that they identified as the staff is not knowledgeable about the system, so they, they don't know how it works, they might enter something in wrong because they're just not familiar with it. Okay, so those are the three failure modes that we're going to work with for this one. Okay, so then we, uh, we go into potential causes of, uh, or potential effects of these failures, and they've got um, injury, death, or dissatisfaction. Um, and I think that's true, and, and they've got that pretty much all the way down. The dissatisfaction would probably flow from the injury or death, is my guess, because uh, the patient might not know that they were improperly identified. I would bet most patients don't really read their own bracelets, or, or if they do, uh, they might, I mean, I think a lot of patients would see their own name and go, oh, well, that's all right, but they, they must have a reason for this. Um, so, so we've got injury, death, and dissatisfaction. You might, you might get, uh, and, and they've also added rework here in, in one of these. You might even get a little bit more specific. Uh, you know, the patient has the wrong procedure done. Uh, the patient has uh, uh, the wrong medication. Uh, or, you know, God forbid we do wrong site surgery. It's actually wrong patient surgery, you know. Uh, so, um, uh, all right. So then we, we go across to the column on severity rating. We see that they gave uh, the first failure, uh, the first failure mode, which was um, incorrect uh, information identified. They gave that a 10. Uh, which certainly makes sense given the ramifications that could happen as a result of that. The second one, which was system failure, the computer is down, they gave a five, 
And that makes sense because, you know, just because the computer system was down doesn't mean that the entire patient identification process would just not happen. It just wouldn't happen as well. Uh, so, so that's a five. And then the staff is not knowledgeable about the system. Again, they gave it a 10. And I suspect thinking that, uh, you know, gee, here if, if the staff is